The following broadcast is released under a Creative Commons license. I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son of God. I believe He lived and died, and that He rose again. I believe and trust in Him. Ascended into hell, Christ our living head will one day come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe and trust in Him. I will trust in my Redeemer, sing of His love. That lasts forever Know His full and sure salvation I will trust in Him Though the world falls around me I rest and know that He has found me Christ the rock is my foundation I will trust in Him I will trust in Him Welcome all to Pastor Yeshua. You've been listening to Creed by Richard Jensen from his album, Order of Service. By way of introduction, Pastor is an acrostic which stands for preaching all salvation through one Redeemer. Our Redeemer, Yeshua, Jesus, is the Hebrew name for the Lord. It means Yahweh, the Lord, is salvation. Translated from Hebrew into the Greek language, the name Yeshua becomes Jesus. The English transliteration for Jesus is Jesus. This program deals with apologetics questions on and about God, the Bible, and the Christian faith. I take questions and seek by Scripture to give answers and encouragement for everyone, including the tough-minded living in today's skeptical society. And now, let's join Pastor Yeshua. Welcome to Pastor Yeshua. In this episode series, we continue to examine another article from another author who, like many, find it necessary to critique Christianity. In this case, the article in question is an internet article entitled, quote, Uncomfortable Realities, 21 Insights About Christianity That May Challenge Beliefs, unquote. As the title suggests, the author presents 21 issues which apparently he believes challenge the beliefs of Christianity. Now, before we continue, it might behoove us to list the five core reasons which we brought up in episode one that represent the quote-unquote confusion and the quote-unquote uncomfortable realities which supposedly exist. Number one, the author is starting from finite man as the authority for meaning, morals, truth, and reality. Number two, the author forgets or ignores that there is an enemy, Satan, who exists as the author of confusion and lies, and who seeks to kill, to rob, and to steal, as well as to thwart the plan of God. Number three, the author forgets that man's unregenerate nature is to sin and to rebel against God and to do what is right in our own eyes. Number four, the author forgets that God is 100% perfect in all of his attributes and not just the ones which man approves of. And finally, number five, the author forgets that God is sovereign over all things, including man. Once again, with this in mind, let's continue a biblical worldview examination of the article where we left off. Issue number five, changing moral standards. The author states, quote, 
Over the centuries, Christianity's stance on moral issues like slavery and the role of women has evolved. This highlights the fluidity of religious values and interpretations, unquote. Okay, wait a minute. Whose moral standards? Moral as defined by whom? If standards are quote-unquote evolving, then why are they doing so? Is it because the Bible or Christianity are quote-unquote evolving? Or is it because various people are succumbing to violating one or more of the five core reasons listed above? Simply because one or 10,000 people apply a label saying quote-unquote Christian does not mean that Christianity, God, or the Bible is at fault. This is simply guilt by association. We could likewise identify people in history who were admittedly atheistic in their worldview. When these people gathered and fathered governments which were responsible for great suffering, death, and the mistreatment of millions of people, we could conclude that atheism is to blame. The point is that the quote-unquote fluidity and the quote-unquote interpretations are not the fault of God, His Word, or Christianity. Rather, as stated, the fault remains with the individuals, both men and women, who suffer from the five core reasons listed above and who as a result of that violate moral standards while for the same reasons incorrectly labeling themselves as quote-unquote Christian. The fact is that the Bible is a book which includes many different genres and literary methods, one of which is simple historical narrative. In other words, the Bible records the good, the bad, and the ugly of human history regarding what happened as a result of the fall of man. Description does not infer proscription, meaning that the description of something terrible in history does not mean that God caused it, approves of it, or advocates for it. It simply happened. The fact that one or more persons in history incorrectly labeled themselves as quote-unquote Christian and then for one or more of the five core reasons listed above went on to incorrectly use biblical historical narratives to then justify or excuse themselves does not mean that Christianity is flawed. It simply means that one or more persons became deluded or lied about their motives, and now we have people who want to use this as a reason to excuse themselves for their own stubbornness and disbelief. But again, this too is revealed and predicted in God's word as being the nature of man apart from Christ. Issue number six, Biblical Contradictions. The author states, quote, The Bible contains apparent contradictions and inconsistencies which can challenge one's faith when attempting to reconcile these disparities, unquote. Well, the fact is, for any regular listeners, you know that so far, I have presented 25 podcast episodes dedicated to discussing and resolving supposed biblical contradictions. Time here prohibits addressing the same issues again or others. But by summary, what we learn is that the existence and explanation of supposed apparent Bible contradictions owes its existence to two parts. Number one, part one is the reality and existence of the five core reasons listed above which exist with mankind. Number two, 
Part two is the failure to exercise proper rules of hermeneutics and exegesis, including but not limited to a correct biblical world and life view, incorrect translation of original languages, improper context, grammar, culture, genre, failure to recognize parables, analogy, poetry, types and analogies, absence of spiritual discernment, and the limitations of scribes, time and environment inherent in the process. Now, more telling than the, quote, supposed contradictions which are claimed is the amazing agreement and uniformity of the integral message despite all of the challenges above. Despite 5,000 plus manuscripts with 66 books with 40 authors over thousands of years, ultimately there is less than a 1% variance of the message. And the 1% variance which we're talking about are limited to punctuation, grammar, and transposition of letters. None of the supposed variances in question affect the central message of the Bible. Further, there is no book in known human history which is comparable to the Bible, which comes anywhere close to having the literary accuracy and internal reliability. And lastly, Almost every one of the supposed contradictions which supposedly exist has been discussed, examined, and given explanation time and time again by various scholars, theologians, and experts. These supposed contradictions exist largely, if not exclusively, as simply a device to cause doubt and confusion by those who present them either consciously or unconsciously, and who wish to reject the Bible for their own ulterior reasons. For this reason, these supposed contradictions will continue to be presented without apology as valid issues because they serve their purpose for the unwary and the unstudied masses. Issue number seven, Human Authorship of the Bible. The author states, quote, Many scholars believe that the Bible was written and compiled by humans, raising questions about its divine origin and infallibility, unquote. So here, in the author's eagerness at any cost to throw doubt upon the Bible, the author has inadvertently admitted that human beings are finite, fallible, and that there is inherently no way by which we can completely place our trust in anything that man places his hand to. This then means that any worldview in which man is the ultimate authority for truth and reality is likewise hopelessly compromised. In fact, it would seem that the author's argument makes the case that what is needed is some source, apart from man, which can serve as the ultimate authority for everything. Well, as it turns out, this is the very premise of the Bible. That is, that God has revealed himself, his nature, and his attributes, his relationship to man, and his plan of creation, fall, redemption, and restoration via his word, the Bible. Now, the insinuation here is that God was supposed to have personally transcribed the same work and somehow dropped it out of heaven to earth in some form that could never be corrupted, distorted, reinterpreted, or somehow misunderstood. Further, the insinuation is that if God had done this, well, then everyone would agree and obey. But the truth is that no matter how God had chosen to do his work, humans who suffer from the five core realities above would still find reason to argue, 
complain and disagree because at the end of the day we want to do what's right in our own eyes and we do not want to submit to the sovereign will of an infinite holy God. The real issue is not the messenger. The issue is and remains the author God and his message. The reason this is so is that any adoption of the message also requires obedience and faith in the author, God, which then brings man into condemnation by the truth, and then the need for repentance, and the requirement that man, as I said, submit to God and not to the desires of doing what is right in our own eyes. Issue number eight, the problem of evil. The author states, quote, The existence of suffering and evil in the world poses a significant theological challenge for Christianity, leading some to question the nature of a benevolent deity, unquote. Okay, well, let's recall that Thus far, I have completed three separate podcast episodes dedicated to providing a biblical worldview explanation regarding the problem of evil. Here again, there is insufficient time to adequately redress the issue. But, by summary, however the breakdown is, the inability or unwillingness of the part of man to understand that evil and its effects are the logical result and consequence of man turning away from the perfection of God's covering grace provided at creation and instead to the empty promise by Satan that man can know and be like God apart from God on our own merits. Once we seek to fully know good and evil, which is what the tree in the garden provides, then both the good and the evil must be experienced in order for our desire to be fulfilled. So, evil was what was advertised. Evil is what we knowingly purchased And evil is now what we experience every day, just as God warned. Now that we've all chosen to open the door to sin and evil, we have likewise opened the door to the reality that all mankind suffers from the existence of the five core realities within our nature. The only way to mitigate sin and evil presently is by the remedies which God's Word and His transforming power by His Son Jesus provide. The only solution is likewise in God's promise and plan, now in action to eliminate sin and evil, by creating a new heaven and a new earth for those who place their faith in Jesus' finished work and His Lordship in our lives. And again, all of this information is revealed, explained, and resolved by the very God and his word, i.e. the Bible, which the author and others choose to instead blame for the problem. Issue number nine, religious hypocrisy. The author states, quote, Christians, like adherents of any faith, are not immune to hypocrisy. The actions of some believers can starkly contrast with the teachings of Christ, leaving others disillusioned. Okay, congratulations, author. You have rediscovered the reality of Romans chapter 3 and others which proclaim that, guess what? We have all sinned. There is none that does good, not even one. We are all sinners, we are all hypocrites, and we are all liars. Um, 
yeah, that would be why Jesus had to come, is because only he, as God, is capable of doing what none of us can ever do. If any of us is accepted by God, it is only as a result of what Christ has done, not what any of us has, is, or will ever do. So, the fact that someone has, is, or will sin, or cause hypocrisy, whether it is a small, insignificant sin or hypocrisy, or some sin or hypocrisy that causes everyone to run screaming into the night, only serves to prove that the above is real and true. God's word repeatedly and amply makes the case that man is incapable, and this is what the author is seeing. The fact that one or many are shocked or disillusioned about the biblical reality of mankind only goes to prove that those in this situation don't really understand the predicament of man's nature and man's proclivities. The real focus has, is, and will forever be Christ, who is the only one who can stand as the example of God's nature and attributes in the flesh. Christianity is about a vertical relationship between a perfect God and his imperfect saints, whom he is pleased to bring to perfection in time when ultimately we stand before him in eternity. For the time being, now, God sees his Son in whom he is well pleased within the hearts of those whom Christ dwells by faith, even though for the time being, now, we fall and we disappoint him and we cause hypocrisy and, and periodically sin due to our old nature, which for now still battles within us. Issue number 10, Historical Revisionism. The author states, quote, Christian history has seen various attempts to revise or sanitize the actions of the church. Acknowledging the darker aspects of this history is crucial for a balanced perspective, unquote. Here again, the author and the like-minded adherents create a phrase which is essentially a branch on the same poison tree of man's sinful nature. It is the same dynamics of man's fallen nature and the results, which are the five core realities listed above, which are the fruit of this tree. Whether we are talking about diverse interpretations, inconsistent interpretations, historical controversies, theological conflicts, changing moral standards, supposed biblical contradictions, human involvement with the Bible, the problem of evil, religious hypocrisy, historical revisionism, or any of the remaining supposed issues, the answer and the problem is the same. We ask, well, what's that? It is the finite and fallen man who individually or in groups acts out according to his own nature, according to the five core realities listed above, and in doing so, so brings unjustified condemnation to God, his word, or Christianity simply because those involved directly or indirectly label themselves as Christian. As has been pointed out, it is not the labels nor the claims of people which qualify them as being Christian. Rather, it is the behavior of those who actually act in accordance with Jesus' teachings, commands, and nature which dictate whether one is in that instance acting as a true follower of Christ and is thus 
as the name defines, quote-unquote, Christian, i.e. a follower of Christ. In the meantime, the existence of one or 10,000 people who act in clear opposition to what the totality of God's Word teaches, and who then later go on to personally or by proxy to have unbiblical behavior or teachings revised or excused, only goes to demonstrate that those doing so are likely caught up in violating one or more of the core realities listed above. So to put this into context, again, the presence of counterfeit currency and or the presence of those engaged in counterfeiting does not delegitimize or negate the existence of valid currency notes which we hold in our hand and are which are true. For the time being, this concludes this episode. Now, if you have any questions about God, the Bible, or the Christian faith, I encourage you to send me an email at pastor underscore Yeshua at yahoo.com. That's P-A-S-T-O-R underscore Y-E-S-H-U-A at yahoo.com. Thank you for listening. Yeah.